I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Police in Washington this morning using pepper spray and batons to clear protesters from the streets around Lafayette Park. Where last night, federal officers and an even larger group of demonstrators clashed. The incident drawing the attention of President Trump, who said he would use a 2003 law to arrest and pursue harsh sentences for those caught damaging or destroying statues of veterans on federal property. They're bad people. They don't love our country. And they're not taking down our monuments. But across the country, in the wake of the killing of George Floyd, statues and monuments deemed racist by some are coming down by force or by government order. Demonstrators this week tearing down monuments to Confederate figures in Raleigh and a statue of Union General and President Ulysses S. Grant, the man who defeated the Confederacy, in San Francisco. In New York City, the Museum of Natural History says it will take down a statue of Teddy Roosevelt in the face of growing criticism over its depiction of black and Native American figures beneath the former president. D.C. police are out in force. The protesters pushed back a full block from the Jackson statue and the White House. Police determined to avoid a repeat of the chaos we saw here last night. An activist in Venezuela has a warning for Americans. You can lose your country. Venezuela has been devastated by socialism, even though it was once the stable democracy and richest country in Latin America. Venezuelan activist Elizabeth Ragnoli Otola posted her warning online. Why do I even worry about some silly little statues coming down or some silly little street names changing? Why do I care? It's because the last time I didn't care about this, I was a teenager. I have already lived through this thing when I was living in Venezuela. Statues came down, Chavez didn't want that history displayed, and then he changed the street names, then came the curriculum, then some movies couldn't be shown on certain TV channels, and so on and so forth. You guys think it can happen to you? I've heard this so many times, but always be on guard. Never believe something can't happen to you. You need to guard your country and your society or it will be destroyed. We didn't believe it could happen to us. Us Venezuelans, Cubans warned us. And we're like, what? Venezuela, we know what freedom is like. That's not gonna happen here. Yet it happened. And there's clearly a lot of people wanting to destroy the US. Was socialism taught in the Bible? Acts 4, 32 through 35. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet. And he distributed to each as anyone had need. Socialists, among whom are a growing number of Christians, seek to influence public policy so that society will become less capitalistic and more socialistic, and they see this as a means to live out the biblical passages just mentioned in Acts 4. However, none of the passages mentioned in Acts call for a socialist society or mandates a redistribution of wealth. The New Testament does not call for the church to embrace socialism within the church, much less in society at large. The donations given in Acts 4 were completely voluntary. The early church demonstrated a pattern of generous giving as the Lord had blessed individuals and as he led them to give to help the poor. There is no mandated redistribution of wealth, and the example of the Jerusalem church was not meant to be taken as a model for national governments. In the book of Acts, the followers of Jesus gave to one another as anyone had need. But was this socialism? No. The key difference is the disciples gave away their possessions freely, and a socialist government owns and distributes property as they see fit. Jesus confronted the money changers and challenged believers to give to the needy. But would he support socialism? Increasingly, Americans think he would. In a recent Barna poll, 43% of Americans say socialism would be a good thing for the country. 51% believe socialism would be a bad thing for the country. The poll reveals a disturbing trend, and here's why. Socialism punishes virtue. Socialists want to distribute wealth 
to individuals according to their need, regardless of virtue. Socialism runs the risk of removing God-designed rewards and consequences. It can punish those who are hardworking by making them pay for those who are not, and it can reward those who aren't hardworking by giving them the fruits of another man's labor. The Bible teaches that anyone who refuses to work should be denied food, as we read in 2 Thessalonians 3.10. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. Socialism seeks to destroy marriage and family. What socialism seeks is for the government to replace the family. That way, it can indoctrinate children in its leftist way of thinking and remove them from any notions of God and religion. Leftists are proud supporters of gay marriage and abortion. There's nothing Christian about socialism, and there's absolutely no way Jesus would ever support it. Welcome to the Watchman YouTube channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Jesus prophesied of future plagues associated with the last days, as we read in Luke 21.11. And there will be great earthquakes in various places, and famines and pestilences. And there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. The coronavirus hitting all-time highs in parts of the U.S. More than 2.5 million cases, now more than 125,000 lives lost. Florida's numbers soaring out of control, hitting a new record high of more than 9,600 cases 24 hours. Miami-Dade County set to close beaches over the 4th of July weekend. A surge in cases forcing Texas to roll back its reopening plans. More than 5,700 new cases in one day alone. The fifth day of cases topping 5,000. One of the largest hospitals in Arizona activating surge plans to handle COVID cases. And sad news tonight about 101-year-old Jean O'Brien, the mother of nine making headlines for beating the coronavirus, her family says she passed away, weakened by her battle and the isolation of quarantine. Washington state tonight hitting pause on counties about to begin phase four of reopening. 23 states now seeing an increase in hospitalizations. ABC's Trevor Alt leads us off tonight. Tonight, coronavirus cases skyrocketing to new records. Florida logging more than 18,000 new cases in the past 48 hours. More than 9,600 infections today alone, a new high. Thousands now showing up to get tested, some people lining up just after midnight, waiting nearly nine hours. In Miami-Dade County, beaches closing for the upcoming 4th of July weekend as Florida bars are now banned from serving alcohol. All of a sudden, we can't even have a cocktail outside. I'm not even near anybody. This is really getting out of hand. Compliance officers now on hand to enforce restrictions. You guys can't pass out those menus. You can okay. have patrons order off of this menu. In New York, a travel advisory from high-risk states, including Florida, and health officials say a person who just traveled from there is infected and may have exposed several people to the virus at a drive-in graduation ceremony in Westchester, four others now testing positive, while in Michigan. Free country, we do what we want to do. Thousands gathering for one of the country's largest boat parties. Law enforcement saying they won't enforce social distancing. Elsewhere in the state, a new outbreak linked to a single restaurant in East Lansing, not far from Michigan State University. More than 85 people infected, all of them between the ages of 16 and 28, and 80 diagnosed after going to the restaurant. I believe primarily the reason this has happened is lack of social distancing and lack of mask wearing. 12 states now putting their reopening plans on pause or reversing them. In California, the governor calling for Imperial County to reinstitute stay-at-home orders. The only morgue for COVID victims there now at full capacity. Officials requesting a refrigerated truck to store the bodies. 
This disease does not take a summer vacation. ICUs nearing capacity in Arizona. Hospitals there activating surge plans. The virus hitting the state's Hispanic population hard. A recent study showing the age adjusted death rate for Hispanic Americans is two and a half times that of whites. Experts say one reason only 16% can work from home. One family losing 42 year old Basilio Lopez, a father of five. It's just such a terrible feeling. Just knowing that that he was there dying by himself. Something doctors nationwide are struggling with. I think that we all know that having people uh, around is one of the things that help us, us heal. And for people to not be able to have that is, um, is, is heart wrenching. That pain felt by both the families and the doctors and nurses on the front lines. Trevor all joins us now from Atlanta, one of the many states where the rate of positive tests and hospitalizations are on the rise there in Georgia. But Trevor, I do want to go back to Florida and that surge in new cases. Senator Marco Rubio now says the peak could be weeks away. Oh, that's right, Tom. Senator Rubio says health officials in Florida tell him they expect this surge to peak between July 15th or even July 23rd. Now, right now, Rubio says this surge is being driven by young people and the median age of people testing positive in Florida is just 34 years old. Various outbreaks of pandemic diseases such as Ebola or the coronavirus have prompted many to ask why God allows or even causes pandemic diseases and whether such illnesses are a sign of the end times. It's sometimes hard to understand why our loving and merciful God would display such anger and wrath toward his people. But remember this, God's punishments always have the goal of repentance and restoration. Second Chronicles 7, 13 and 14. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. In these verses of scripture, we see God using disaster to draw his people to himself, to bring about repentance and the desire to come to him as children to their heavenly father. The spread of viruses such as Ebola and the coronavirus are just a foretaste of pandemics that will be part of the end times. We move on now to the showdowns across America. Protesters toppling statues and monuments of Confederate leaders and slave owners. Six people arrested after clashing with police in front of the statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee in Richmond, Virginia. Here's ABC's Andrew Dimber. Tonight, tensions mounting over monuments. In Richmond, Virginia, demonstrations taking a dangerous turn just before midnight Friday, attempting to topple this statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee. Police releasing this body camera footage saying protesters fired paintballs and threw projectiles at officers. President Trump overnight signing an executive order instructing the Justice Department to enforce existing law, saying anyone who tries to remove or deface a monument will be arrested. The order singles out left-wing extremists, but recent intelligence bulletins by the FBI and Department of Homeland Security also warn against violence from far-right, white supremacist, and anarchist groups. Today, the president tweeting 15 times U.S. Park Police bulletins seeking to identify those involved vandalizing a statue of President Andrew Jackson here in D.C. last week, saying president's statues won't come down on his watch. They're looking at George Washington. They're looking at Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Jefferson, not going to happen, not going to happen, not as long as I'm here. Near Capitol Hill, there is a push to remove this statue depicting President Lincoln standing over a freed slave. Some want it gone, calling it demeaning. Others point out that freed black Americans paid for it. The Apostle Paul in his epistle to Timothy tells us in the last days society will be in a total immoral meltdown. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. 
Now to the latest in a year of extremes. These are hazy days for millions of Americans as a massive dust cloud drifts across much of the country after making its way from the Sahara Desert. CBS's Michael George has more. It's nicknamed Godzilla, a dust cloud 700 miles wider than the United States. The International Space Station captured this image of the largest plume of dust from the Sahara Desert in decades, sweeping across the Atlantic Ocean. On Earth, the dust is visible from the shores of Costa Rica to Texas. Jeff Baradelli is a CBS News meteorologist and climate specialist. I have never seen a dust cloud this large and this dense move that far and not disperse before it got to the United States. So this is thicker and denser and potentially more hazardous than most that we've seen. In Houston, the thick, dusty skies brought in choking air, deemed unhealthy. The particles in the air over New Orleans made the Big Easy look more like the Big Hazy. All that dust brought a murky Saturday to Dallas. Meteorologists say this round of the dust storm will weaken by Monday, with some dust lingering in the southeast. But there's a second round of dust moving into the Caribbean now, and it too will make its way to the U.S. The sky is just going to get very hazy. Most of the dust exists from a few thousand feet up to about 18 to 20,000 feet, and that will probably make for vibrant sunrises and sunsets. Sunset and sunrise tonight and tomorrow. Look to the sky. The hues are likely to be more orange or red. In the book of Job, chapter 37, 5 through 13, we learn that God controls the weather. God thunders marvelously with his voice. He does great things which we cannot comprehend. For he says to the snow, fall on the earth, likewise to the gentle rain and the heavy rain of his strength. He seals the hand of every man, that all men may know his work. The beasts go into dens and remain in their lairs. From the chamber of the south comes the whirlwind, and cold from the scattering winds of the north. By the breath of God ice is given, and the broad waters are frozen. Also with moisture he saturates the thick clouds. He scatters his bright clouds, and they swirl about, being turned by his guidance that they may do whatever he commands them on the face of the whole earth. He causes it to come, whether for correction, or for his land, or for mercy. Correction is the Hebrew word, Shabbat, which means, literally, a stick for punishing, writing, fighting, ruling, walking, etc. Job 37.13 can be translated like this. He causes it to come, whether for punishment, or for his land, or for mercy. God controls the weather for three reasons for punishment, for his land, or for mercy. The extreme weather we have been witnessing is clearly punishment. In Hebrew, the journey is called Aliyah, Jewish people returning to the promised land. Just before COVID-19 hit, CBN's Chris Mitchell traveled from Israel to Ukraine for a close-up look at the prophetic story in action. In the early morning, 130 Ukrainian Jews landed in Tel Aviv to begin a new life. Many see the moment when these new immigrants step onto the tarmac here at Ben Gurion Airport as the time when the words of the Bible written thousands of years ago come to life. There has never been a people who have been exiled for so long who then return to their homeland, return to their language. And so there's the prophetic reality of this that's so huge that each one of these people Isaiah saw, Jeremiah saw, they saw them, they saw this happening, and now we are here to witness it. We are here to be part of it. Their flight marked the one year passing of Yael Eckstein's father, Rabbi Yakiel Eckstein, the founder of the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews, now simply called The Fellowship. He always felt a calling, that it wasn't him, but God working through him to unite Christians and Jews, to bring biblical prophecy to fruition. Although their trip ended in Tel Aviv, the life-changing journey began more than a thousand miles and a number of choices away. We wanted to find out why they made their decision. We know that Israel is the best place because we have also our relatives there, friends. Israel has many advantages. It's much safer. You just can go out at midnight and feel perfectly safe. Some saw opportunity like 53-year-old Eugene. I know in Israel I have a future. I have a job. I have pay. For some, it was a matter of faith. It's a decision not only mine. It's a decision of God. It's a decision for my family. 
The fellowship helped smooth the way by providing documentation, logistics, and finances to bridge the gap from their lives in Ukraine to a new start in Israel. This orientation helped provide the information about their next step. Benjamin Haddad is director of Aliyah for the fellowship. We want to get higher the joy and the hope and get less the afraid. But there is all the time this moment together in the hearts of the people, the frightened from the future, from the unknown, and the big hope and the happiness about new beginning, a new country, and a new future that is waiting for them. Each person's belongings get a number, and they're permitted 70 kilos or just over 150 pounds to start their new life. With last minute instructions and documents in hand, some headed back to their apartments for a last minute goodbye. It's about 11 o'clock here in Kiev, just outside the Kavalenko apartment. They're loading their last belongings, and in a few hours, they'll be on their way to Tel Aviv, but they haven't told most of their neighbors. Only one neighbor from this home knows uh, about my departure. Only one neighbor? Only one neighbor. And because you don't want the other ones to know. But why? Why, why don't you want them to know? Because pe uh, people didn't like me, didn't uh, want that me and my family will be happy. Because you're Jewish? Yes. <laughs> the hardest part was leaving her best friend. After they finished loading their luggage, a last hug and goodbye to their best friends. The family then headed to Kiev International Airport for a few more hours of waiting before boarding their plane. It's about a three-hour flight from Kiev to Tel Aviv. But for most of the new immigrants on this plane, this flight will be the biggest step of their lives. A safe landing on a new land. Now I appear in my real motherland. I returned with my children and my husband, and now I'm so happy, so proud. The most important thing in my life. With threats to the Jewish people rising worldwide, Eckstein believes it's time for the Jews of the world to come home. The fellowship typically brings 5,000 Jews to Israel each year. Sometimes I think that the reason why Isaiah said that the Jewish people would come home to Israel in the end of days is because he knew that anti-Semitism would once again raise its ugly head and if they didn't come home to Israel, the only country where there's a Jewish government, where there's a Jewish army whose only concern is protecting the Jewish people, unlike anywhere in the entire world, that there wouldn't be any Jewish people left in the world because of all the anti-Semitism. And so I look at this as you never know when the borders are going to close. You never know when it's going to be too late. And so the fellowship, as soon as we have the opportunity to bring a Jewish person home, we do it immediately. Hatred of the Jews is so common that a word has been coined to describe it. It is called anti-Semitism, a term recognized worldwide. But was hatred of the Jews actually foretold in the Bible? Yes. According to the prophet Jeremiah, God said, And I will pursue them with the sword, with famine, and with pestilence and I will deliver them to trouble among all the kingdoms of the earth, to be a curse, an astonishment, a hissing, and a reproach among all the nations where I have driven them. Deuteronomy 28.37 And you shall become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all the nations where the Lord will drive you. Astonishment is the Hebrew word Shema, which means ruin, by implication, consternation. Consternation means amazement or dismay that hinders or throws into confusion. Why did the Jewish people become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all the nations? Jeremiah 29, 19. Because they have not heeded my words, says the Lord, which I sent to them by my servants the prophets, rising up early and sending them, neither would you heed, says the Lord. Because the Jews' ancestors disregarded God and refused to obey him, they faced a great tribulation of hostility and persecution lasting many centuries. Is there a lesson in this for the rest of us? Yes. The Apostle Paul wrote concerning the severity of God in punishing his chosen people. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell, severity, but toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. Romans 11.22 The Christian church is doing the same thing that God warned the Jews about in Jeremiah 29.19. Because they have not heeded my words, says the Lord, which I sent to them by my servants the prophets, rising up early and sending them. Neither would you heed, says the Lord. 
why anti-Semitism now? God is using anti-Semitism to bring the Jews back to Israel, fulfilling his prophetic word. Ezekiel 37, 21 through 22. Then say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, wherever they have gone, and will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land, on the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king over them all. They shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. Hosea 3.5 Afterward the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. Did Christians replace Jews as God's chosen people? No. I've heard many teachers say that nowhere in the New Testament does God reaffirm his covenant with the Jewish people regarding the land of Israel. If God promises something over and over again to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and to their children, then he confirms it to Moses and Joshua, and reaffirms it through Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the other prophets, does the absence of it in the new covenant make it null and void? Can God, who cannot lie, break his promise? I would think not. If so, our faith is on shaky ground. But still it's puzzling that the new covenant doesn't affirm God's promises to Israel. Or maybe it does. Let's take another look. In Romans chapter 3, just after Paul makes the case that there is no need for non-Jews to be circumcised, that circumcision of the heart is far more important, he clarifies his point to make sure that his Roman hearers don't misunderstand him. He doesn't want them to assume that there is no covenantal value in being Jewish. So he says in chapter 3 verse 1, What advantage then is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? Well, based on these teachers, we would expect him to say none. <laughs> but instead, he says much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. And those words include the promises of the land of Israel to the Jewish people. He goes on to say, what if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every human being a liar. What is it that God will be faithful to regarding unbelieving Israel if not the land promises? In other words, despite Israel's unbelief, God will be faithful to his covenant. Now, we're not talking here about the covenant of eternal life, which can only be received through the blood covenant cut by Yeshua himself. Paul is referring to God's promises to Israel through Abraham, namely the land promises. In Romans chapter 9, when Paul makes his impassioned plea, willing to trade his own salvation for that of Israel's, he says, the Israelites, to whom belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises. Notice he doesn't say belonged as in past tense, but to whom belong present tense, the covenants. That would include God's covenant with Abraham regarding the land of Israel. In chapter 11, Paul asked twice in verse 1 and then again in verse 11, Has God rejected Israel? Both times he says, by no means. The Hebrew Bible says, chas v'chalila, or God forbid. And by not rejecting Israel, that must mean that God has not canceled his promises. In verse 29, Paul emphatically declares that even in unbelief, God's gifts and callings to Israel are irrevocable. In Acts chapter 1, Yeshua's disciples ask him if he is now going to restore the kingdom to Israel. Yeshua doesn't respond by saying that those promises are, are voided in light of the New Testament. Instead, he says that the Father knows the exact time to fulfill his promises. Zechariah tells us very clearly that Yeshua is returning to Jerusalem at a time when the Jewish people are under attack. If the promise of the land of Israel is null and void, then to where is Yeshua going to return? And lastly, Revelation 1-7 says, Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Obviously speaking of the Jewish people. But if there are no longer any Jews or any Israel, of whom is John speaking? To be clear, the greatest promise of all is eternal life through Yeshua the Messiah. 
But as great and wonderful as this promise is, it doesn't cancel out God's former promises to Abraham regarding the land of Israel. So we see that not only does the New Testament affirm God's promises to Israel, it predicts a massive Jewish revival in the end times. Praise God. God did not replace the Jews with Christians as his chosen people. This lie is called replacement theology. Replacement theology is the teaching that the Christian church has replaced national Israel regarding the plan, purpose, and promises of God. Genesis 13, 14 through 17. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him. Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever, and I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. Romans 11.29 For the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Why this great deception within the church? It's a supernatural phenomenon. Ephesians 6.12 For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Satan hates the Jews with a passion. He hates them because God provided both the Bible and the Messiah through them. He hates them because God called them to be his chosen people. He hates them because God has promised to save a remnant of them. He hates them because God loves them. Satan works overtime to plant seeds of hatred in people's hearts toward the Jews. He is determined to destroy every Jew on planet Earth so that God cannot keep his promise to save a great remnant. He tried to annihilate them in the Holocaust. He failed. He will try to destroy them once again during the last half of the tribulation. He will fail again. Replacement theology is an abomination. It is unbiblical and it has resulted in virulent anti-Semitism that has in turn resulted in the deaths of millions of Jews. If you are a Christian and replacement theology is true and God is done with the Jew, what makes you think he isn't through with me and you? When God makes a promise, he cannot lie. So we know the promises he made to the Jews and to the Christian church will be fulfilled. Titus 1, 1 and 2 Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Hebrews 6, 17-18 Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. There is no reason for the church to be covetous of the promises that God has made to the Jewish people. He has also made some glorious promises to the church, one of which is the rapture. Additionally, we have been promised that we will reign with him over all the nations of the world during his millennial kingdom. And we have been promised that we will live with him eternally on a new earth, in a new Jerusalem, in new glorified bodies. It is no wonder that Paul wrote, No eye has seen, no ear has heard nor has the mind of man conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. The coming seven-year tribulation is for the salvation of the Jewish nation, in which the Jewish people will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him, as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. They will receive Yeshua as their Messiah. They will cry out, Baruch, Abba, Bashem, Edne. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What a glorious day that will be what glory it will bring to the name of God. Zechariah 13, 8 and 9 And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. I will bring the one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them, and I will say, This is my people, and each one will say, the Lord is my God. Luke 21:28. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. Occurs on a Sunday morning. My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready!
The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine, faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is short. Accept Jesus today.